Welcome to the stream uh, using Twitch this time and welcome to the beverage channel. This week we will be discussing uh, Homer's works. Homer, the Greek uh, historian, poet, one of the first historians kind of set up the history genre uh, as it is and was around 2000, no, 1200 uh, BC and documented the Trojan War as well as the return of Odysseus. So the Trojan War, uh, the initiation of it was documented in his work Iliad and the return of Odysseus, which was after the Trojan War, was documented in the book The Odyssey. So we'll be covering both as well as how they are applicable to today. You can find the agenda uh, in, if you go to discuss at beverage.me, you'll get the links or in the video description, once this is actually uploaded, you will also get the, all the links that we'll be discussing. So we've got the agenda here and we're going to base this one over. I keep saying we, cause usually it's a group show. Uh, this one is just me. Uh, so, so when I say we will just, uh, just assume at least for this one, it is just myself. Uh, so I will right, we'll be going. Going through uh, how to read a book, I'm doing it again, just have it. Uh, well, how to read a book, we studied on the Beverly Channel a, a few months ago, and it gave us a great uh, way of discussing books, notably asking these questions. What is the book about as a whole? What is being said in detail and how? Is the book true in whole or part and what of it? So it's worth checking out those streams. I probably have linked them in the video description. Uh, and the other interesting aspect of this book is they provide a reading list. And the first books on the reading list is Homer, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, hence why I've read them. So when I read this book, I was thinking of undergoing a philosophy degree. And then this book actually was like, hey, you know, to understand society, all you have to do is just understand the great works because society is based off the legacy, like the shoulders of the giants who have iterated through civilization. So if we understand the books that built civilization, then we understand society. Uh, and we kind of earn a philosophy degree without actually having to go to it. And if we do our own readings, we really work ourselves up without being taught how to think. Uh, we earn uh, that ability of how to think. So we have a mind, we should probably learn how to use it. And the book, How to Read a Book is great. It uh, kind of really goes into how to use your mind and how to have a conversation with the author so you can kind of become an equal with the author. And for any work, uh, it is to ask those questions, which is what is the book about as a whole for a movie? You can also ask it about a movie. What is being said in detail and how? And is the book true in whole or part or what of it? So we've got quite an agenda here. We'll go over the context uh, of the times around when Homer was around so you can understand the relevance uh, of the works as well as go through what Iliad was about and then Odyssey as well. And then about key takeaways. So what are the key takeaways or learnings from it and how can we apply it to today? Which somewhat goes into why the author would have wrote it because we'll find out that Greek was in a declining stage there. It was the end of the Mycenaean uh, period of Greek civilization of the Greek empire. Uh, it was the end of the Mycenaean Greek empire. There was many Greek empires over the course of Greek history. So it was the end of that one. So Homer was trying to catalog what society was like at that time. And Homer is kind of like a amorphous figure. We don't know if it was one person, multiple people, a man or a woman. It could have been a community, but we do know that the stories were put together around 1200 BC. And from there, uh, they were then articulated for about 300, 400 years, just verbally. And then in around 800 BC, they were then documented. So by that point, there was a thing called the Dorian invasion. Uh, However, that theory has actually been blown out the water because it could be that the Dorian Greeks, uh, which was like another subculture of the Greeks, was already there. Uh, and rather than them actually being invaded, and there's also like an amorphous sea people. But is sea people referring to the Egyptians or just other Greeks? Because the Greek has 
hundreds of islands uh, and that was kind of the culture. So if we go through my notes here, we can see that the Greek Empire continued quite a while under different branches. Uh, we'll go through uh, this little video and we'll be able to see uh, uh, the stages of civilization around that time that was important to us. You, you got to bear with me on my very slow computer. It's not used to uh, streaming in this capacity. All right, well, while the video is trying to figure out what it's doing, uh, I'll go through my previous notes. So we've got Homer here. That's, that's what we uh, uh, kind of attribute to the image of Homer. I've used that in the thumbnail. And this is Mycenae in Greece uh, here. So we can see Greece is like a whole bunch of islands, many, many islands. And the key ones right over here is Ithaca, or what is assumed to be Ithaca. Right now it's called Ithacae, but Ithaca is the base of, it's Odysseus's kingdom. So the second story, Odysseus is trying to get back to Ithaca, his kingdom, and reclaim. So... And the reason why it's called the Mycenaean is the capital was right here in the middle. So we can see here a bigger map of what the scenario was. So we have Italy over here, uh, the Greek Empire emerging from here under the Mycenaean Empire. Before that, there was the first civilization, which was a Crete civilization. Uh, and then it was the Greek and then also around over here, the Persians, although there's conflicting sources on whether the Crete one was the original. Uh, it depends which historian you're listening to. So there was a Crete civilization, then there was the Mycenaean civilization, uh, and then everything else kind of emerged. So for those who aren't good at national geography, you have Africa, this landmass down the bottom. You have Italy, Europe all the way up the top here. This is Greece here. Uh, this is now modern Turkey. And, but we'll refer to this area more as just Persia. So over here, you, around Troy, you had the Hittite uh, ethnic group or race, and they were kind of doing their own thing around this period. They weren't really a threat at this point in time. But Troy is the bit of the Iliad here. So the Greeks, they kind of all assemble the armies to kind of invade Troy and uh, get Helen uh, back. So we'll go into that in detail, but the geography is somewhat important. Uh, if we, let's see if the video has uh, loaded, maybe I just need to restart the whole, restart the browser tab. Yeah. All right, we went too far in the future. So too far. All right, here we go. So 1200, so this is around the time it was written. So we have the Hittite Empire here, or Hitti Empire. We have the Persian up here. We have the New Kingdom, which is the pharaohs of Egypt. Uh, then we have some little things going on here. Let me see if I can bump the quality here so I can actually see what the text is actually saying. All right, so it's the Phygia, the Hittites turned into Phygia, Phygia, oh, Prygia, Prygia. The Persia is kind of turning into the Middle Astrian Empire. Something's happening over in China. Let me speed this up at two times. We don't need to go through the whole video. So around this time, between 1200 and 800 BC, uh, is called the the Bronze Dark Ages. So materialism kind of greatly declined after the writings of Homer. Um, well, after the story of Homer, his writings, the writing of those stories happened around 800. You, similar thing happened in Egypt. We saw there was a big empire and then it just consolidated around the Nile. Uh, there was a talk in all these areas of sea peoples. Um, they were all under the threat of sea people. 
So sea people could refer to one nation, however that seems unlikely with modern historical evidence. It seems more likely everyone was kind of fighting uh, each other because one of the issues with civilization is you can risk overpopulation. And when you have overpopulation, then you exceed your ability of the land mass. So what happens is a small amount of peasants can now grow food for the masses due to modern agriculture. And you have a civilization that provides some sort of law and order, be it a atrocious authoritarian law and order or a benevolent one. Either way, uh, you have a structure that allows a city to kind of form and then peasants to grow. So you have specialized jobs and that enables a gro huge growth of population, but also poses the risk of overpopulation and then forced emigration out uh, so people would either pillage undeveloped tribes to reclaim resources for themselves uh, or they would trade with tribes they considered equal in development we only be the ones which were able to defend themselves <laughs> so uh, so around this time there's a big question mark actually for why did the Greek Dark Ages occur and we'll go into some of the ideas here and uh, Homer's works kind of also help to elucidate uh, that a little bit what I did not want to full screen that all right, all right. so a lot of innovation happening around Persia region And here we'll start seeing much bigger empires start developing. It's kind of like the psycho technologies of how to manage thousands of people start happening. Or political technologies. So then you have the Archimedes uh, Empire, which was a Zoroastrian. So this is now when there's a clear cut good and evil. They were kind of the religion that introduced a clear cut good and evil. Before that morality, was kind of very sophisticated. Uh, it wasn't really clear cut. Uh, you know, there wasn't really a good concept of evil or or good prior to then. And they pretty much dominated everywhere. And then your Greek uh, kind of got quite small, and then it boomed uh, really big under the Macedonian Empire. There we go. And then the Seleucid Empire. Now we have more stuff happening over in Asia. And you kind of get the idea, but now we're way out from kind of the relevance of Homer. So I'll close that tab. So get, now let's get back to Homer. So we covered actually in a, in a previous stream uh, Sir John Glubb's Fate of Empires, and in it, uh, you can stream here. The link will also be in the description, but that's what the thumbnail looks like. And there's several stages of a, of a empire uh, in that stream. Uh, the if you go on the Dropbox paper, you find it. But the relevant parts here is that uh, Greek was in under his framework. Greek would be under the uh, Affluence intellect decline uh, phase. So we'll we'll go into that, but let me make sure I've covered all the notes so far. So yeah, Homer's stories were set in approximately 1200 BC. Uh, 2000 to 800 BC was Mycenaean. God. All right. 2800 BC was Mycenaean civilization. After 800 BC was a Bronze Age collapse um, of the West. So yeah. It should say between 1200 to 800 BC was a Bronze Age collapse of the West, maybe. Um, I need to verify my notes there. So in 500 BC, Persia saw the expanse of the Archimanid, Archimanid uh, civilization. In 300 BC, Greek came back under the Macedonian, and then the Seleucid civilization, which expanded beyond Persia. And in 100 BC, this expanse collapsed, with the West becoming the Roman civilization and the Persian expanse becoming the Parthian civilization. 
and over which over the next 2,000 years, the caliphates of Islam expanded through Persia in the south, the Khans expanded through the steppes, and the French emerged, which, and eventually the Northwestern Europeans and the nation states uh, all emerged, and Asia competed under many different dynasties. So what happens is you have this pattern of a civilization being around, and then there's either an expanse or a collapse uh, around a 250 year mark. Um, and even though it's like the same people, their form of empire, the governmental system gets like a major revolution um, or collapse kind of phase. So what's, what's the context here, right? So using Sir John Glove's dichotomy of stages of empires, Greece would have been in the stages of affluence to intellect to decline. Many cooperative tribes, many kings, many lords, many slaves. It was a palace economy. There's a Wikipedia page documenting what a palace economy is. Pretty much you have a landmass or a region. Uh, in Greek, it could be an island, like in the case of Ithaca. So you have the king of Ithaca being Odysseus, and then there's people who are free, uh, and then there's the slave class as well. And the slaves aren't particularly treated like the way that 12 years of slave is necessarily uh portrays it out to be uh the slaves can be quite revered uh and uh it's more like it's a servant class uh ness rather than the kind of imagery we have of the egyptian slaves um or the i guess slavery in usa from at least what the movies and and western propaganda efforts uh make it out uh i'm using propaganda without any derogatory basis so Important aspects of economies, and I'm also not denying this horrific treatment of slaves, but there's also horrific treatment of just everyone in general at times. <laughs> so we'll go over it in all of this, but the, the big generalizations of which there are many, many exceptions, right? So important aspects of economies managed or at least overseen by the government. Different tribes had different cultures, respect and trade. Uh, so globalism were important with equal uh, tribes or civilizations or nations. Uh, when assimilation and a conquest, colonization was important for those they considered more barbaric or less able to fend for themselves. As if, and this is a constant theme of colonialization, which is that you are beneath us, you aren't capable, uh, we can provide better for you, you uh, should be treated like children and we have to take care of you. Or even in the modern workplace, it's like, hey, uh, come work at our company, our company is better than what you were doing. Um, so that's like a mimetic colonization, or it's even corporate colonization, uh, depending on it. So important to keep these developments in mind. Uh, 2000 years later, we also have fascism in Italy, which was a corporate, corporate, corp, corporatism, uh, where the country was divided up into pretty much 22 companies. Uh, so, uh, Kind of interesting how a lot of these ideas kind of repeat, but then with slight twists or evolutions upon them for changing uh, times and more newer technologies to integrate them. Because politics is a tool to uh, utilize collective will. It's a psychotechnology to utilize collective will as a way of supplementing individual will or the shortcomings of individual will. So for instance, in defense, uh, a collective army will kick the shit out of a whole bunch of anarchist individuals uh, because they can't assimilate or organize themselves well. And this is one of the great stories of these fate of empires. Uh, a lot of the times it's just who could organize the armies better as those who won um, or who had the bigger firepower. If you would watch um, The Triumph of the Will, uh, which was a Nazi propaganda film, uh, they one of the greatest films uh, made, and that's not my opinion, uh, and the greatest propaganda film made, uh, it wrestles quite deeply with the idea of collective will and the power of collective will. And it took America seven films to kind of argue that movie. So it's quite, uh, the collective will argument is quite challenging. And you can kind of see collective will also occur with Iliad, where you have multiple tribes then to fight and invade Troy against one tribe. So the War of Iliad. So what was Iliad all about? And what was kind of the, the circumstances of Iliad? This is the Wikipedia page for it. 
So we have a lady called Helen. We have Thetis, Hera, and you know, kind of the Greek gods we are quite familiar with. So Paris of the Trojans stole Helen, which was the most beautiful woman of the world, daughter of Zeus and a Spartan princess, the wife of Menelaus, and who was the king of Sparta, and allies with the Achaeans, the Greeks. So the, the Greek, they weren't just one ethnic group, they were many ethnic groups, which were quite similar. Uh, the idea was the different groups were kind of founded by one deity who interbred with humans or just one royal family kind of thing. So one of the interesting things about Greek, uh, ancient Greek culture is that of any exceptional ability, which is kind of what royalty imbued with some exceptional ability, uh, a god was probably your parent, um, one of your parents, but you also had your human parents. So it was like God moved through uh, your human parent through conception. Uh, so you had both a human lineage and a God lineage. Uh, so unlike the Christian idea where Mary was a virgin, uh, whereas if that was more Greek theology, uh, Mary would have had sex with Joseph and however Joseph would have been imbued or the gods would have worked through Joseph to create Jesus. So, uh, so it was God, like a God possession or God, um, uh, like a spiritual realm acting at the same time. Uh, so the same type of abilities, just working in both uh, narratives at the same time. So very much a Peterson or Jungian type idea of thinking about the world, which is there's this religious plane uh, or spiritual plane, which is like the narratives that humans are interacting with the world with. And then there's this objective plane, which is that of science and of, of objectivity. They didn't really have a clear way of defining that, but it was certainly in the conception of the world. So there was this uh, physical plane and then there was this spiritual plane and they operated, uh, they interwove with each other. And we'll see this through the artworks and through these narratives. So Paris was stolen. Uh, so, okay, Paris of the Trojans stole Helen, uh, which was the wife of Menelaus, the king of Sparta, and allies with the Achaeans. So, the Trojans want back uh, Chryseis, the daughter of one of Apollo's Trojan priests, who Agamemnon of the Achaeans stole as a war prize. The Trojans offered wealth, like to say, hey, we'll offer you wealth if you give us back Chryseis. Uh, but the Achaeans, they just want Helen back. They don't care about the wealth. Just give us Helen back, and we'll give you Chryseis back. But then Trojans were like, no, no. We, we really like, like Helen. She's really pretty. We're keeping Helen. We all want to give you wealth, though, for Chryseis. So the gods and humans become intertwined at this point. Apollo uses the gods. So Apollo's on the Trojan side or has some allegiances with the Trojans. So Apollo uses the gods to commence a plague against the Achaeans, which is like the Greek ally um, tribe. If we remember back at the map, the Trojans are kind of where the Hittite uh, people kind of will will roam, they're separate from the Greek at this point. So uh, Achilles, the leader of several Achaean armies, so a big general, we know Achilles is the one who was dipped and became immortal, except everything but his ankle, uh, asks the gods what can be done to end the plague. And as such, has Odysseus returned Chryseus? So Odysseus will go into a lot more in the second book, the Odyssey. So Agamemnon is furious that Achilles you know, made this deal with the gods to have Odysseus return Chryseus to end the plague. So he then takes Briseis, the wife of Achilles, and Briseis is actually a sport of war that Achilles earned. Uh, so when you would go into war, one of the great things about war, if you're a, uh, you know, a Greek at the time, is you get to name the women of the, you know, you go into a tribe, you slaughter the people there and you get to claim the pretty women as your wives or your harlem or your slaves, um, depending on the nobility you wish to offer them. So not only do you get wealth, do you get animals, do you get that, but you also get uh, a beautiful amount of women who you can have a bountiful amount of children with. So, and there's also interesting aspects to that, right? Because you then have... Uh, if you are in a society where war is common, uh, it's a way of 
uh, with evolutionary fitness propagating uh, whoever is the warriors. Um, so maintaining a strength part of the genome. Say, like, you know, for instance, if I breed, I'm not, you know, I have probably more brains than I have muscles. So not probably going to be that good of a warrior, but maybe a good general or whatnot. But <laughs> you kind of get the, uh, the idea here. They're kind of optimizing for traits that are suitable for for that uh for that kind of world there and genghis khan is the asian similar thing kill all the men rape all the women have thousands of children make up a double digit percentage of the asian genome uh worked uh quite well for their uh for for them i guess <laughs> so achilles is furious makes a pact with his goddess mother um because argument on stole his his wife uh so achilles is furious makes a pact with his goddess mother thetis who spins a web of plots with the gods to inspire zeus to trick argument on on battling troy prematurely so the battle then proceeds with interweaving of the narratives of the kingdoms the gods and the humans oftentimes a duplicity of various obligations so different gods have different allegiances on both sides well, sometimes the same god has allegiances on both sides. It's pretty much an epic drama, and these are considered the epics by Homer. So, so you can start to see some of this uh, in this artwork here. Let me go to this uh, other screen here. So you'll see this is part of the War of Iliad, and you'll see the uh, gods fighting alongside the humans. Uh, and also the gods fighting amongst themselves in the heavens. And sometimes, you know, there's an intermixing between the two. So in terms of like a war story, it's fascinating. Uh, that's what the Iliad is, essentially, just a huge war story, story where you have gods fighting among gods, you have, which are immortal. They can't really die. They can be condemned. Um, but then you have humans who actually kind of die and then they go to the underworld and live on as dead people. They can't really come back. But even among the, uh, the humans, like you'll have them, which create the gods will create storms or they'll create earthquakes, uh, or they will even embody or possess certain humans at time, give them superhuman strength or even fight alongside them as giants. So you have this really epic, uh, scene. So, so Zeus, uh, the king of the gods, with all the same dramas as human kings, he gets tired of it all. He's he, he's just your typical man, and there's just too much drama for him at one point. And he's he gets frustrating. He sets a decree that the gods are not to intervene in human affairs. So Zeus is also considered the god of the stranger, or the god of guests. Uh, so he. He's one who also maintains diplomacy and maintains peace, uh, which would also be fitting that he's also the king of God. And we'll go into this a lot more with, with the Odyssey. So Zeus sets a decree that the gods are not to interfere or intervene in human affairs anymore. Hera, the wife and sister Zeus, then with the blessing of Aphrodite's lust power and the blessing of Hypno's sleep power, distracts Zeus into a lustful slumber so that the Achaean support gods can secretly interfere against the Trojans. So one of the interesting things here is pretty much everything is imbued. Any force in life is imbued with a god uh, or embodied by a god. So Aphrodite is kind of the god of love or lust, and these can be used for good things or bad things. It's not really, there's not clear distinctions of good and evil uh, at this point. So Hera uses Aphrodite's blessing and gets imbued with this overwhelming lust. And also she uses, gets the blessing of, of Hypno to also lure uh, Zeus with lust and then also to put him to sleep so that way the gods can interfere. Uh, so, right, and it allows the Trojans to uh, kind of get a little bit weak at this point. So. Zeus, he wakes up from the slumber and he's enraged at Hera. Uh, he relinquishes the decree to match the odds. Uh, so now he wants a fair fight. It's become an unfair advantage because of Hera's influence. So you know, he's like, fine, underwind, fine underhanded work of the eternal bitch. Uh, so even though it's his wife and his sister, 
uh, there's very uh, human char characteristics in these gods. They uh, have a lot of human type emotions and a lot of uh, typical bickering <laughs> uh, in there. So he he's very in enraged and uh, uh, decides to lift a decree and now it's full out war, not just like a mediated war. It's now a full out war between the gods, uh, including the uh, with the gods assisting the humans. So blows and deaths are exchanged on both sides. Achilles is sitting idle in the Zetmin for Agamemnon, and he sends his best friend Patro Patric Patroclus, Patroclus for an update. Patroclus, however, dies at the hands, hands of Hector. So Hector is like a great, more like giant general uh, of the Trojans, their best warrior, the best fighter, the leader of their army. So Achilles, the best warrior of the Achaeans, however, and one of their best generals, laments his idleness and turns into a rage to kill Hector, who, risking the wrath of the gods, he plans to deface the corpse and withhold an honorable burial. Zeus orders the return of the defaced body of Hector, the Trojan warrior, to return to the Trojans for the mourning to complete. Both sides then lament those they have lost and the mistakes they've made. So that's kind of of where, where the Iliad ends and there's no real clear winners or losers there. The war is still kind of ongoing. Also, hello to Piero Stream. Uh, just saw your chat message. So good to have you here. If you have any questions, uh, post them below and uh, I'll respond to them. So then we enter into the second major work, or I assume, I don't know how many works Homer did, but the one that we still read today, so the sequel to Iliad, which was the Odyssey. And this is based years after the fall of Troy. Uh, so we kind of learn what happened after the Iliad through memories and recountings in the story of the Odyssey. So years after the fall of Troy, which battle continued after the Iliad, with the use of the Trojan horse, the warriors must now struggle with getting home. So Odysseus, the king of Ithaca, has success several villages who supported the Trojans um, on his journey back home because these journeys take months uh, and he's either engaging with trade or pillaging uh, and at times though uh, it's not particularly clear whether or not these are uh, kind of good situations so my notes uh, I'll riff rather than just looking at my notes here so uh, Odysseus here uh, let's see so Odysseus is trying to get home. All the warriors of Troy, they've won it over with the Trojan horse, uh, which was also some of the intervention of the gods, kind of giving them the idea and everything um, to do that. And again, any major force is also somewhat the gods had something to do with it. So they won. Now it's a journey to try and get back home. Uh, some of the people get home fairly quickly. Some take a very, very long time, just depending on the different fortunes people have. Odysseus's team... Uh, they have a lot of trials and tribulations on the way home, uh, some misfortune, um, and they end up on certain islands uh, where it doesn't really go that well. So uh, we get a story here where uh, he, pretty much the what happens is uh, there's, I can't remember the, the exact events. King of Ithaca, let's see if I can go into it. Um, well, I don't think I really need to go into all of it to just go into the value. And it's, I, I like the book Odyssey a lot better than Iliad. It's well worth reading. So I'm just going to read the notes. So Odysseus, the king of Ithaca, has successfully in several villages who supported the Trojans. However, through the happenings of several tales of which the wrongdoing victim are at times fuzzy through competing considerations, Odysseus ends up cursed by Poseidon and stranded on an island as Calypso's husband. He lost to home to his family and his kingdom. Athena takes pity of Odysseus. So Athena is the god of wisdom and cunning. Uh, takes Well, actually, just the god of cunning or intelligence. Uh, takes pity of Odysseus and feels he and his family have suffered enough and partners with the gods for a safe return. Meanwhile, Odysseus's kingdom in Ithaca, who assume he has perished, have numerous lords competing to marry the wife of Odysseus, Penelope, to claim their fortune. Telemachus, Tel, 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 Telemachus, 
The son of Odysseus and Penelope is frustrated at his own ability to deal with the situation. Their coming of age story. Penelope and Telemachus, despite their doubts of Odysseus' well being, remain loyal to him and long for his return to set things right. Athena assists Odysseus and his family several times in the island hopping adventure back home to set wrongs right and to repair an ethos, so principal behavior, of goodness with guest friendships along the way, recounting the history. The gap since Iliad. We learn that Agamemnon, however, was killed upon his return by his adulterous wife. So we kind of, uh, the, we now get into the takeaways of these, these works. Uh, uh, and one of these similarities here, this last part about Agamemnon is uh, so you have all these suitors, these lords competing for, for Penelope's, for Odysseus's wife, Penelope. Uh, Telem Telemachus isn't strong enough to really do anything about it nor can he really say no because it's also the custom that penelope is to be wed because they also have to decide who's going to be king um and uh you know there's also like there isn't a clear law and order in this stage that triumphs might makes right uh so telemachus can't particularly just say get out everyone because there's always the threat of him being killed, um, which is one of the plots here. So you only have rights if you can defend your rights. That's kind of the world there. So well, that's kind of why they're waiting for Odysseus to return. Um, and Odysseus, however, he goes on his travels home. Uh, he stops. Uh, they're going island hopping. Uh, eventually, they kind of end up uh, at one island, and there's not really any wind for him. Um, actually, I'm not sure which which story kind of happened first. I know there's like a Cyclop Island. Uh, yeah. So there's no. So that would have happened later. Yeah. So he, he he's with his men. They end up like stranded on one island. They kind of run out of food. They've been advised by the gods not to eat the sun god because on on the island now of the sun god. And they've been advised not to eat his cattle, but the men are starving because it's been so long, and the winds, uh, which is another force of the god, hasn't driven them where they need to go. They don't have like you know metal ships with you know rudders that can just guide them where they need to go. Um, instead, they have to wait for the wind to guide them where they go, and the wind hasn't blown in the way that they need for several months. So they they start starving on this island, and the men kind of vote to kill the uh, the the animals and kind of make a sacrifice when they get home but this still pisses off the uh the god so then uh i think the winds do change um but they end up just on some very unfortunate adventures where they would go into an area and one instance is they go to like the land of the cyclops and it's very fertile land but it's kind of like an anarchist land there isn't really a civilization there um there's a bunch of very strong individual tribes but they haven't really told the land they haven't really progressed in a civilization but they are giants they're scary they have one eye they can throw men around um so they kind of get abused several times by these kind of uh godlike uh uh entities who kind of curse them and and harrow them and the men end up um fulfilling the prophecy of their demise and Odysseus ends up stranded at Calypso uh, for, for several years uh, where uh, Calypso I think is the daughter of Poseidon so Poseidon um, uh, his son was one of the Cyclops who was blinded and so Odysseus then gets the rage of Poseidon and Poseidon won't let him return home Poseidon is kind of the god of earthquakes and big seas and Kind of anything terrifying in the natural world um in terms of big natural disasters or like big movements um where the winds are actually zephyr uh, is the god of the winds or the winds or the spirit of the wind i guess um but actually there's many different god uh gods for the wind there's like the northern wind the southern wind the eastern wind and the western wind they all have different names so uh, he ends up stranded on this island and now he wants to kind of come back home uh, and that's when the gods, Athena takes pity on him because Athena also identifies a lot with Odysseus. They're both very cunning. Um, so 
I she also kind of starts intervening and makes those plots to get a Odysseus back home. Um, and you have many different stories, and we'll go into the takeaways. It is well worth a read. So takeaway. So for me, there was three big takeaways. Uh, the first one was spiritual embodiment. So gods like humans, they have similar dramas, but the gods are eternal. There's exceptional humans, and they are assumed to be parented by the god who embodies their exceptional qualities. There isn't a clear cut good and evil. Everything is sophisticated. Even gods are vulnerable to deceit and manipulation. Clear good and evil came 800 years later, so 500 BCE, through the civilization of the Archimedes and Zoroastrianism, which expanded from Persia. The forces are treated with great reverence, and they also got kicked. Uh, like they were very much like a more libertarian country. Um, uh, there was kind of equal rights. The Germans they didn't really have slaves. Uh, and then the Romans came in, uh, or the Greeks, uh, I'm not sure, but when the Macedonians, yeah, so the Macedonians then just kicked their ass um, just because they could assemble collective will better. So forces are treated with great reverence, and, and then it all collapsed down because they failed to integrate uh, the colonies that they, they actually conquered. Um, so <laughs> you kind of have this birth of collective will, and then you have uh, its breaking at the seams when individual will kind of is like hey you're kind of neglecting the individual here and this is like just the force that repeats and repeats uh but we learn each time this this repetition occurs and we kind of change the game a little bit so forces are treated with great reverence respect and awareness many forces embodied as gods such as lust or the winds or imbued by the gods so some of the language there is like dawn rosy fingered dawn blesses the morning each day on her throne right so the rays of light in the morning is the rosy fingers of dawn um and during evening is like when uh dawn retracts uh retracts those fingers through dusk so many forces and then hubbub uh descended upon the crowd so also emotions uh they will descend upon people or they'll possess people or they'll move in people. So it wasn't this like uh, disembodied uh, way that atheists, born atheists, have of integrating with the world. Like these are these are things on another plane that are moving through people, and it's actually very useful to actually kind of believe in in this worldview. Uh, and the theists uh, still today kind of have this integration. Well, like say for instance evil is like demon or satan possessing someone that allows them to actually visualize it where they can actually offer a defense because once you embody a demon and it's very easy then just to neutralize the demon uh, be it physically or metaphysically so whereas an atheist everything's just super abstract super amorphous uh very hard to actually deal with things like so for instance happiness like we could try and define happiness in our brain but then it could be like, well, there's certain rituals you do, and then happiness will bless you, right? So, you know, it's a lot of this stuff is is quite powerful way of looking at the world. So, every thought is an entity of force that preoccupies us, uh, and, and dreams visit us from the underworld. Uh, so, a dream will be like sent from the gods into you if it's more prof prophetic. Um, or the dreams just kind of rise up. And the underworld is interesting, right? It's also like the Jungian uh, shadow uh, type situation here. And humans, like when they die, they go to the underworld. And and in there's one part where Odysseus kind of goes to the underworld and chats with the uh, deceased or actually kind of conjures up those from the underworld in like a, a portal um, and has a conversation with them. And it's kind of interesting because prior to, to, in that scene, one of the things we kind of learn from that scene is as humans, they don't really know the judgments of kind of what's befallen or what is the truth. But when they conjure them up from the uh, underworld or, you know, through the dreams or they have prophecies, then they kind of actually learn what the judgment of the gods were of their character or of their misfortune. They, because now in the underworld, they have a more direct relationship somewhat to the gods. So there's also this source of like divine uh, interpretation that now befalls them when they can visit uh, these realms. So one of the other things that is interesting is epithets are unquestionably common. 
Um, so pretty much this could be just like a result of the verbal storytelling. Uh, they didn't have a written history, or at least it wasn't a focus. Instead, these stories were done verbally. So you know, things were like Rosy Fingered Dawn or Gleaming Eyed Athena or uh, Zeus, God of the Strangers um, or Stormy, Zeus, uh, Stormy Poseidon, things like that. They would always have uh, certain attributes like adjectives to describe a, a person or a thing. Um, with Odysseus, it was used like sly Odysseus, um, and Penelope would always be loyal, faithful Penelope. So uh, you always have these little descriptors. And uh, Emily Wilson, in her introduction, she was the translator of the Odyssey that I read. Uh, she goes in a lot into uh, that as a tool for people to kind of remember the traits. There's a lot of recounting as well when, you know, Odysseus is retelling a story to a new guest. He kind of tells things we as the reader already know because we've heard that story before when he tells it to a previous guest. But these could be ways of kind of rejogging the memory and cementing the story within the those articulating, verbalizing, performing uh, the story. Uh, for the 400 years it went unwritten. So they also embody uh, esteem and blessings into daily rituals and etiquette. So constantly, uh, Emily Wilson, she kind of notes that the God is always the most important person at any dinner, at any celebration, at any event. The gods are the, always the most important guest. Uh, so they will have libations. Whenever they have a drink of wine, they'll pour a little bit out first. Uh, when they are uh, you know, going to do a big meal, they'll sacrifice an animal. If they're going to go into a war, they're going to do a hecatomb, which is a slaughter of a hundred animals. Uh, there's also a parallel there when Odysseus uh, ends the suitors and kind of reclaims the kingdom. There's about a hundred suitors. And it's also the, uh, it, there's also a festival for the gods the next day. Uh, I think uh, an archer. Uh, the god of archery so there's he's kind of also performing a hecatomb to the gods uh this reclaiming of his kingdom so you uh there's a lot of parallels here where uh, even for an everyday thing uh you also get into the benefits of prayer even why prayer has survived for so long one of these practices because there's a clear delineation of things which are in the hands of gods and their blessings requested through packs of which a dowry or offering is made a sanctified. So what happens is, uh, uh, so one of the observations then is like not much anxiety exists. Like you have very strong emotions, they have strong grief, but anxiety isn't really that much of a thing. Uh, they're, you know, if they want courage, they like summon courage and they get everyone riled up. Uh, Odysseus does many speeches to kind of get it. Then there's times of remorse and times of grief where everyone cries. Um, and I meant so like everyone is kind of comfortable expressing their emotions, but with his interaction with the gods, uh, it's kind of like, you know, there's certain things which are in the hands of the gods and there's certain things which are in the hands of humans. Uh, so if something's in the hand of the gods, well, nothing can do about it. It's in God's hands, but we may be able to make a sacrifice to the gods, right? To kind of malleate what is in our ability. So, you know, if we want... Um, something to be done. So let's say in modern context, let's say we want a promotion. We may praise Athena, the goddess of cunning, so we can embody her traits via her possession, as well as make an offering to her so she, sub she subdues other gods to affect the agency of your boss to notice your increased abilities. This is much more practical than mere hope, right? Like, I hope I get a promotion. Please let me get a promotion. Because the rituals here give a release of our obligations, allows us not to have anxiety. Will I, won't I get it? Instead, it's in the hands of the gods, right? We've entrusted the gods to take care of it. And if the gods do fail us, um, then perhaps it's a sign that we need to offer a better sacrifice. We needed to do more ourselves, to sacrifice more so the gods will be in our favor, right? So it could be, I may need to work harder. I may need to embody Athena more. I may need to develop a better relationship with Athena with that cunning, with that intelligence to be able to earn her favor amongst the gods and her favor with my competitors. So very much uh, really, really useful uh, here. And we can see this with modern prayer, like 
like there's aspects of prayer like let's say your friend's uh father uh has cancer then you know rather than just being like my condolences uh you can do like our prayer and the prayer here isn't really like dear god make sure he gets well right because that's you putting your own valuable interpretations you're just a mere mortal you don't know the grand scheme of things like you're in you know you could be it could be worse for the world if that father lives you don't know right that's that's something for the gods to judge and only the gods so instead you can say look you know he's been a good friend to me please gods do whatever is best he has my favor may he have yours too right and then you're kind of saying well no matter what happens uh you know i i hope that whatever is best happens right and and it releases you from that kind of struggle uh and assumes that and you know you could also make sacrifices as well which is like you know if you're going on a flight and you want your uh luggage to all arrive uh undamaged um because you're moving city then maybe you can you know make a pledge and be like look gods like let me offer a libation like you know a piece of chocolate for like all the chocolate i eat if my gear arrives and that way instead of enjoying the whole flight where you're like oh jesus i hope my my luggage arrives undamaged uh, and worrying, 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 uh, instead you're like, it's in the fate of the gods, I've done my bit, right? I've offered my sacrifices. If it doesn't work, maybe you should have made a better sacrifice, tried tried more prior to the journey uh, to ensure that, that things will work out. And obviously, uh, evolutionary, we've kind of refined these traits, right? Like the sacrifices you make that are actually relevant towards getting the result are going to be the worthwhile ones. But if you're just going at purely uh, atheistic or secular, you risk this embodiment and this embodiment is powerful right like you know if you're running um you know it may be something where you think like okay like you know let's say you're running a marathon are you doing the marathon just for yourself are you doing it for a cause are you doing it for your family are you doing it to raise charity are you doing it you know for all these different reasons and then you know if you have strong reasons they kind of move you or embody you further um, they enlarge you, turn you into a giant. You're not just one person running, but you're actually a person representing something much larger than yourself. And this is also one of the issues with uh, the risk of ideology uh, that has occurred. Which way do I need to move? This way. <laughs> one of the issues with ideology. Um, uh, so you watch uh, Triumph of the Will and you see that uh, people say, like, you know, our Fuhrer Adolf Hitler is Germany. And he is the will or the embodiment of Germany. And therefore, we pledge our allegiance to Hitler as we do to our country because we have eliminated class. We're just one people. Uh, so for and there's kind of a power in that because in the same way that people watch sports, they kind of get embodied with the team. You know, the team is them. They are the team. And if the team loses, maybe they didn't cheer enough, right? And when the team is there and they're being cheered on by the crowd, the crowd is also possessing and giving them strength. Uh, so these are very powerful things that that the uh, the pure atheistic world just doesn't accommodate. Um, so something really fascinating that to to you know keep in mind as a takeaway. So yeah, so such intentions of the gods they're read by omens, be it a dream or you know birds or sneezing uh certain things sneezing is also another evolutionary one right they just they just had a plague like 20 years earlier um so you know sneezing would be a, a symptom of the plague where it's like hey if someone's sneezing it means death uh death be upon you or you know to those who are cursing the person who is sneezing right so a way of saying infectious or even travel you know they were an island people they did travel they would have brought disease so uh, you know, if a traveler sneezes, uh, they may already have immunity and they deal with it less and then they sneeze and it curses those who don't have the immunity. They, instead of just sneezing, they, they perish and they die. Uh, so a lot of these behaviors, uh, you know, they can be metaphysical, but there's physical consequences and physical outcomes um, that occur here. So in the modern context, let's say we want, yeah, okay. This is much more practical than me. Hope I think I've kind of argued that uh, if the gods fail, yeah. All right. So lamentation is common. People really embodied their emotions. There was no qualms about it. Certain displays of emotion could be subject of debate or reverence uh, or reproach. Uh, however, it was always something worthy of respect or notice or bringing out. People 
they they really express their emotions. Negative ones, they express it. Positive ones, they expressed it. They were very emotional people, uh, and they would pro reproach people if if like a like rather than in thinking I shouldn't show this emotion, um, because blah 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 blah. Uh, anxiety, 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 they just showed it and then they would be reproached and then an argument or a debate would occur about whether the emotion was appropriate or not. Um, however, those who did withhold where it was done with deliberation then were blessed by Athena with cunning and slyness, which wasn't really a bad thing. It was a competitive advantage, therefore it was beneficial. So the other big takeaway, right? So we have spiritual embodiment as the first one. The other big takeaway for me was nostos. So Nostos is a journey home, the return journey. In the modern context, Alice in Wonderland is the Nostos story. Uh, she gets transported to another location and her journey now is getting home. So, you know, the typical adventure story is you're going somewhere, you're going on an adventure. When a Nostos story uh, is interesting because it's actually a journey home. And you kind of contrast the differences in these two stories quite interestingly because Let's say you want to go somewhere else. It's assuming that where you're leaving was insufficient. You There's something more. There's something you need to go out there to bring back to revive the culture. Whereas a journey home, um, or you just condemn your homeland and you want to go out to this new world and you consider it better and you emigrate out, right? Like for the gold, the gold rush or whatnot. Whereas for um, a Nostos one, the part of the communication or the the mythos of the story is why why come back home why why go home why is home worth it so that's really what uh the odyssey is also trying to communicate why why did odysseus ever want to go home and they gave him many many trials uh and tribulations to really threaten in that negative ones horrific ones where he was very much condemned had to go through horrific things uh and other ones which were very blissful like an island of where he you know had a goddess who who wanted to be uh his wife uh and you know provided all the food and all the grace and everything he could want and why would he sacrifice that um or even in other kingdoms where he could be about princesses who he, you know, were mortal and he could grow old uh, with with a family as well. So why why leave uh, those things, right? What was it that was so worthwhile in his homeland? So compared to an outward journey, this inward journey contains more acts of self-reflection over one's past to reconcile dissonance and communicates one's culture and character by contrasting and testing it. Same thing happened in Alice in Wonderland, right? She has the uh, the three characters who embody different uh, characterizations that she needs uh, within herself. Like It's kind of like a dream session, like a nightmare, where her unconscious, the underworld, has sent a dream to her uh, to say, you know, you need to resolve these this cognitive dissonance or this metaphysical spiritual dissonance within yourself here is a test we're sending you in a dream um not alice in wonderland yeah alice in wonder what's the one with the the the, the hat i think well they're both suitable alice in wonderland and the other one the uh one where she's got her slippers right or there's like the evil witch right at the end they probably both have an evil witch, but the one with like the lion, the Tin Man, and uh, whatever the other one is, right? Yeah, they're both kind of suitable, right? Like they're going on a journey, a dreamlike thing uh, to solve uh, the issue. So there's somewhat an act of rebirth, uh, sometimes involving a visit to the underworld and back, Odysseus certainly uh, kind of conjured a portal. Uh, and important to today. So. Even for today, uh, these stories are, are very important to us. Uh, you know, myself, I've lived as a, as a digital nomad and, you know, I've encountered other cultures my entire life uh, quite severely uh, or intimately uh, as well. So intimately different than sexually, uh, 
It's just spent lots of time with very good friends uh, overseas in cultures that are incredibly foreign to me. Um, so yeah, to reconcile what of our, so for today, right? Like why is Nostos important today with the return journey? So to reconcile what of our culture is actually meaningful? What is it worth returning to? What's worth of our culture fighting for? Uh, what's worth undergoing the trials of journey uh, to restore? And this isn't just like passive placations. Like, you know, if you're America, like we have the American dream, the land of opportunity. Like, where's the embodiment of that? Like, like, and America's kind of crumbling. It's the same thing, like why people leave religions. Like at some point, uh, if you can't find the answers for meaning in your previous, ideology or your axioms you're going to forgo those axioms they're not suitable for dealing with the trauma or the omens that have befallen or summoned you so you have a calling now for origin and rebirth so uh, it's the same thing for a country if the country can't sustain itself ideologically uh, which is kind of the role of when it's done deliberately is the role of propaganda uh, then and the role of great education uh, to maintain that ethos, that principled behavior, then it will crumble upon threat and uh, temptation. Uh, you won't be able to achieve what Odysseus did. So this, this is also why Odysseus is special, right? right? Because it's not the story of uh, why like he made it back home and that's why he was the protagonist right like the protagonist is an Agamemnon who was killed by his wife right the protagonist is Odysseus because he had a telos a axiom a worldview an ideology that survived uh, harsh and horrible um, trials so some of the trials he encompasses or encounters, I mean, is the sirens uh, of their temporal and hedonistic satisfaction. So, you know, when you're in the seas, there's a story of the sirens. They sing these songs and you lose your mind and you just wish to join them, right? In modern culture, this is uh, kind of embodied by, let's say, if you're a woman, it would be embodied by uh, the maybe the Fifty Shades of Grey kind of guy, where it's like tremendous wealth, but also not really there. <laughs> um, uh, uh, maybe that's like a twilight thing. But, you know, a dysfunctional relationship where initially it seems amazing, like wealthy, handsome, uh, but then he slams your head in a drawer when you don't uh, abide by things, right? Uh, so that would be like a siren. Um, for a woman, it would be, I mean, for a man, it would be like a woman who is beautiful, offers you sex, you get her pregnant and then she uh, destroys your entire life right that's the uh, other uh, siren thing and you kind of wish like oh maybe I should have had a principal behavior of courting so that way I uh, I could have evaluated the omens prior to losing my my head um, so another one is the opiates of the lotus eaters there was a tribe called the lotus eaters they spent the whole days eating lotus flowers and which is an opiate um, a mythical opiate yeah. or it could have been a real one um they haven't really tracked it down there's some candidates but it's essentially serving as an opiate right so some of his crew members kind of uh eat, <laughs> eat the opiates and they don't want to go back home so then like Odysseus and his men just like grab them and they're like protesting nah let me stay and uh I, you know, they kind of slap them out of it, kind of get the guys in rehab, <laughs> figuratively, um, you know, back on the ship. Uh, the lands are beautiful nymphs, uh, so often there'll be an island where there's like bountiful nymphs, uh, which, you know, but is that your own home? Is that your own family, right? Like, uh, at least for Odysseus, he wouldn't return to his family. And we'll go into why uh, soon. Then there's also lands of bountiful fruits, which go unsustained by agriculture. So like the Cyclops, Cyclopes uh, nation. So Cyclopes is the race of the Cyclops, the giants with one eye, right? And it's kind of interesting because they didn't really have civilization. Like the one eye could have been uh, metaphorical for them not seeing the 
duplicity of life, right? Like two eyes, uh, we have twice as good vision, but, but we could also perhaps see a later development, good and evil, um, where one eye, our vision or in our wisdom may be less. Um, so the Cyclops embodying one eye kind of shows that they were barbaric. They didn't see clearly. They didn't see the potential in front of them. They also didn't see the bad. They weren't as wise as the Greeks then. Um, so, uh, but the land was bountiful. It had plenty of fruit. It was great fertile land, plenty of sheep, but it wasn't toiled. It wasn't uh, something that could have, they didn't put in the effort to create a great civilization that could defend itself. They just created one that could make an individual person strong and not one that could create a civilization that could defend itself from pillage. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons he also likes Ithaca. He describes it as a rugged land. It's not really that fertile. The women aren't really that pretty, uh, but it's his home and it, it's, it's, it's his home. And he goes into this. So, so what are the stories which, so for even today, what are the stories which communicate why, why even live where we are? What is good about it? What tests does it win against? Who fails against those tests? How can we improve? And it really asks the question like a Nosos journey or Odyssey, like what is home to you? What is home to Odysseus, right? What is the qualia of home? Like what is the aspects of it? How do we actually really define it? How do we embody it? How do we make it real, right? So, oh, yeah, what makes you feel at home, right? Like that's one of the ways we can try and find out the quality of it. Um, why those things? Are they important enough to fight for? Are they important enough to die for? If you had all the beauty and all the materialism, is there something missing, right? And what do you overcome? Like, like all this thing, like this answer of home, like there's a quote in here I've, uh, in the agenda document. Uh, there's a series of quotes, uh, highlighted quotes, that I thought kind of pertain the uh, premise or the significance of this work. And one of them is they say there is nothing worse than being homeless. Um, and when the whole story is a returning home and why home meant something to Odysseus, why it was worth fighting for. And also when we wrap this into uh, the context, you know, the great dark, ages the bronze dark ages the fall of the uh mycenaean empire was just around the corner right why was this the story that survived um and why did it survive the 400 years during this collapse right people were searching for what is left that's worth fighting for we have all the affluence why uh why 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 continue we're now so how do we overcome our nihilism? If we have affluence, we can just live on the couch. We don't need to go off. Like why, why bother, right? Um, so to Odysseus, his wife was not as pretty as Calypso, the goddess who wanted her as his husband and kept her on her island. Nor were his lands as fertile as others on his trip. However, Penelope, his wife, she was his. Tel Telemachus was his. His People were his. For Odysseus, it was his community, not so much as a possessive, but as a assimilation within, an embodiment, a love, a cultural and spiritual intercourse with his homeland. Right? So we should take this very seriously. This is what the closed border Europeans are fighting for today, or what any nationalist, regardless, regardless of ethnicity, is fighting for. They are fighting to maintain their community, their legacy, their attachments to reality. For them, it is the realest thing there is. Also, a CEO of a company, right? Why do they get up each morning to fight for their company? Right? This can't just be dismissed with open borders. We see the issue of cultural conflict in both of Homer's works. The viscosity that people will fight for to protect their women, their men, their children, the land that they earned and the deep despair and chaos that befalls a nation when community begins to crumble, when there isn't something left returning for. So while Odysseus was home, I, I mean, away, uh, his home crumbled. Uh, it became ripe for pillage. Uh, when there isn't someone to protect your home, what happens to it? Uh, when there isn't someone to protect the principles that your home is founded on, 
what happens to it, right? And to some extent, you know, Odysseus was that who granted that embodiment for his culture. He was a benevolent king. He had slaves, but he treated them well. Others did not treat his slaves well, right? And he treated his people well too. And that all came into thread. And, and you know, over the 400 years since Odysseus, uh, the sea peoples came and threatened. There was a lot of war, a lot of pillaging, right? And that was happening. Um, and it, there's kind of like a warning at the end of the book, like a premonition, um, you know, of what the Greeks may have been wrestling with. Like, this is a problem of this civilization, right? So first last with a few men who crumble, but it affects all the men. This is a problem. Uh, but if it affects all the men, then it becomes a problem. Odysseus is renowned, not because he is one of many, but because he is one of the few whose determination, resiliency, and love allowed him to return and reclaim and claim what he deserves. He is exceptional in his love, in his meaning, in his purpose, in his character, in his virtue of the time. The story of Open Borders is the story of the Odysseus estate during his absence. No ability to enforce order. Conflictual claims, chaos destroys sustainability. Open borders without any normativity is a disembodied telos of the acrimonious and unpleasant. Those who get rejected or rejected a lot, so profess they themselves should be welcome, like the suitors. However, if they worked on their character to interpret, interoperate sustainably within the communities they visit, to be a good guest rather than just an entitled one, they would be welcomed more and rejected less. This is not an anti-immigration argument. Immigration instills normative assimilation. That does not mean complete assimilation, just interoperative assimilation. This is detailed explicitly in Odyssey, which we will go into now. So the third of the three takeaways for me was, well, how do we reconcile with strangers, right? Like, you know, we have borders, how do we engage with trade with others? What if we wish to assimilate the homeless? Right? Like the homeless are seeking for a home. Do we have a home worthy of their selection? How do we show them we have a home worthy? How do we show we have a home worthy of trade if they wish to maintain their own home? How do we show we have a home that they shouldn't invade and pillage? How do we show we have a home that is worth defending? This is the question of Xenia, the guest friendship ethos. This is the other major theme um, in Odyssey. So strong tribal nations using open trade with interoperable societies. They focus on defense, honor, duty, production. The rituals and guests, rich, so yeah, there's rituals for the guests and strangers, and it's something suitable for today. So whenever a guest would appear in a new kingdom, right, like there's many islands, many kingdoms, some of the big islands may be split into multiple kingdoms, right? And then there's a palace economy. So kind of everything embodies to the instruction of the king who kind of enchants other people. It says, ah, oh, this one isn't really that important. The people can make up their own minds. This one is very important. Let's manage this and watch it closely, right? So when there is a guest, uh, it, word may, depending on the importance of the guest, word may travel all the way up to the king. Uh, or the unusual peculiarity of it. Um, but generally, if you're arriving as a guest, you probably had a ship. Uh, so you're probably wealthy <laughs> to some extent, right? Like, it's not like the slaves are necessarily traveling unless they are within a crew of someone who is uh, worthy of having a crew. So uh, ignore the left wing counter argument to that, right? Like, uh, you know, obviously, there's a line of bickering that could happen on that statement. It's irrelevant to the actual point. Um, and it's just bickering. It goes into way more detail on that, right? So there's a ritual here about accommodation. So the arrival and the reception of the guest. The guest is then bathed and provided fresh clothes. So, you know, they've gone through this dangerous journey. They're weak and the host wants to console uh, them in kind of like the host's womb uh, for now, make sure that their needs are taken care of. 
Um, because otherwise you're also cursing zoos, right? Like, and that's one of the themes in it, which is they've learnt, you know, being an island people, that if a guest shows up, uh, it can either bring great terror or great fortune. So if you treat them well, uh, you're probably going to arrive at a game theory pattern, like an evolutionary pattern where treating guests well probably works better in your favor than treating them poorly. Because if you treat them poorly and they were important, then you could start a war <laughs> and everyone dies uh, or whoever is cursed and did the more barren action. So it's best to uh, treat people well, otherwise Zeus will condemn you, right? So, you know, you enter them into your, your womb, your kingdom, uh, make sure they are taken care of, right? They're, they're weak, so you want to kind of rebirth them um, to an extent. So providing food and drink to the guests. Uh, so then there's the dinner. Once they've kind of relieved themselves and recuperated, then there's the dinner. Uh, and questions may be asked of the guests and entertainment should be provided by the host. So during the questions, uh, it's like this testing ritual. So Odysseus or the guest here is hesitant to question the loyalties of others. The guest tests the loyalties of others by questioning them. The characters reply to Odysseus's questions to the guests. Then the guest proceeds to reveal his identity. The characters test. Uh, so the host then tests the guest's identity. There is a rise of emotions associated with the recognition, usually lament or joy. And finally, the reconciled characters work together. Right? So once there's like this interplay where there's an establishment of trust through cognitive testing or mimetic testing, mimetic challenges and, and figuring out whether or not we are interoperable, whether or not you're going to curse our kingdom and pillage it, or whether or not we can interrupt and trade with each other. Um, then they're given a place to sleep, uh, and both the guests and hosts retire for the night. The guests and hosts exchange gifts. The guest is a good guest. They exchange gifts if they can, or they promise uh, future gifts. Um, the guest is granted a safe journey home, and the guest departs. So... So as Odysseus travels, he inherits a bunch of riches from the benevolent kingdom, kingdoms which he uh, was able to visit and establish great trading and, and exchanges with the other kingdoms um, who were benevolent to him. And those who treated him poorly, um, or he treated poorly, he endured the wrath of the gods, or they endured the wrath of the gods. So... This is uh, where I think I haven't uh, written it down precisely as a note here. So let me riff on this, right? So one of the, we've covered it uh, a series of videos on the Berry Channel on politics, right? Uh, about political instability. There was uh, also one about how uh, the concept of freedom of speech is irrelevant because it doesn't matter about you having the ability to say things anymore. What matters is whether or not you actually have an opportunity to be heard. And that opportunity to be heard is being completely destroyed by uh, large propaganda efforts, um, which drown out uh, voices that need to be heard and create dissent. Um, it's quite accepted um, that there's national as well as corporate uh, propaganda wars to deliberately create dissent to destabilize economies, to destabilize communities, to destabilize other things. Um, it's cold warfare, it's just continued, it's just gotten more intense. Um, so what's a way you can combat that? And the way you can combat uh tribal warfare is xenia the guest friendship ethos you invite people you disagree with into your home um but you test them <laughs> right you are uh, you test them but there's an obligation that you are going to be courteous to them and they will be a good guest to you right if you're going to also engage with it um like a nation that has this great principled ethos, they will end up surviving um, because they're willing to engage in trade, willing to engage in revision, willing to bless strangers. 
Um, so we see as well with Homer, right? This was a collapse of a uh, the nation. They won Troy, but then there was a lot of infighting. One of the uh, last quotes in the book is Odysseus announcing. Um, here we go. He's reclaimed his kingdom. However, meanwhile, I have to go on raids to steal replacements for all the sheep those swaggering suitors killed and get the other Greeks to give me more until I feel my fault. Right? So he's lost a lot of wealth in his kingdom because of the suitors. Um, there was a war within Ithaca uh, between the relatives of the suitors, a mob justice of vengeance, and the gods intervened and brought peace. However, he wants to continue his explorations. He wants to continue his trade. Uh, and this could be a warning, right, to the Greek people. This could be why I was at the end. It could be a warning. Um, because several times uh, at the beginning, uh, right at the, kind of the first thing that happens is he's warned. Uh, while you're on the sun god's island, do not overstay your welcome. Do not be a bad guest. And they eat the sheep. And if he didn't do that, he was promised safe return. But they ate the sheep. <laughs> Uh, or the cows, and uh, and he knew that would cause ruin, or his men did. Um, so it, it could be a premonition of where uh, he's going to uh, <laughs> risk encountering the exact same misfortune, um, because he hadn't yet. It would be centuries, or I think a few thousand years, until um the pillaging thing kind of wore out or this colonial uh need kind of wore out um and you know the macedonian empire came in and like kicked the uh uh the Achaenid uh empire's ass right because they were more like libertarian tribes and uh the macedonians came as like one united war front and just kicked their ass so and then it also crumbled because they failed to kind of like assimilate those within them. Um, so for like the 400 years post Homer, you have a lot of infighting between Greek communities. You may have had some slave revolutions. Um, and yet this is the story that survived. Like why did this survive through those revolutions? Why did this survive through the invasions? If there were invasions, even if small intra civilizational uh, invasions like tribes invading tribes um and i think it's this the story i think it's uh that's my theory at least because there's a big question mark like i did a lot, a lot of research on this so I, I went to talk about this last week and i wanted to really know this and it is a big question mark um so i think this is why this survived right you had the story of Troy and Iliad and you had this story and this is kind of what they're about. They're kind of about what is worth fighting for in our culture? Why is our culture worth saving? Like, and what is the bad bits and what are some bits that are better? The bad bit is this pillaging, like this senseless pillaging. Um, and the good bit is when we engage in trade. So, however, it hasn't got like a clear-cut aspect in that sometimes you know the men were starving they felt they needed to pillage what are you going to do and it's kind of like a good acceptance here like it's it's a story here of well sometimes like shit just happens maybe you overpopulate and you have to go somewhere and maybe the tribes you show up to they don't want to engage in trade so it's like is it your people who starve to death or do you just kill them and take the food in the land i like the cycl cyclop cyclopes right they didn't develop the land. Your people are starving. Uh, screw these barbarians. We're going to take it, right? And this is what happened to... Uh, we did a show... Where, let me get into the thing. All right, I'll, I'll go into the big chatting window. That way I can move around a bit more, right? So we did a previous episode uh, called uh, Eastern World War II History, uh, where we looked into what were Japan's uh, thoughts on World War II. Why did they go into it? And it turns out they were fighting for world peace. That's why they went in. 
uh, you will find as common in any uh, country that goes to war. They, they're the ones who think they're fighting for peace. And, you know, if they won, they would have got peace. So, <laughs> so, you know, both sides are kind of fighting for peace within their, uh, their idea of their ethos. Right? Like there's a, because uh, what happened was there was the League of Nations. Uh, well, prior to that, in the 19th century or 18th century, America rocked up to Japan. Japan was practicing the Bushido ethic, a very individualistic samurai ethic. Everyone was expected to be able to take care of themselves. Trade was for losers. It meant that you uh, couldn't take care of yourself if you needed to engage in trade or beg. Um, so everyone was meant to be completely self-reliant. Um, and that was a Bushido slash samurai ethic. But then the collective power and economy of America rocked up with these big boats um, and humiliated Japan. And Japan vowed to never, ever engage, like never, ever to be humiliated ever again. So then they engaged. They noticed that trade was what opened them up to the world. So they, uh, well, you know, was the unique thing about uh, USA that gave them such tremendous wealth and power. So they engaged with trade, but for them was the unscrupulous people because of the strong ethic prior. It was the unscrupulous people who took over in trade. But they also had the same issue that the Greeks had or any civilization will face if it doesn't manage uh, their population well, which is overpopulation and starvation. So League of Nations happened. Japan rocked up around 1912, I think it was. And they said, we need to emigrate out. Otherwise, we will starve. Please let us emigrate. And the Aussie prime minister was like, nah, white Australia policy, yeah. And uh, then America and Canada were just like, yeah, we're, we're just gonna listen to this Aussie guy. And uh, they didn't permit Japan to emigrate. And uh, Japan needed, then uh, in their belief, they uh, had to invade China. Um, and also there's the other motivations there, which is that they were concerned about America's uh, possession of the East through the trading with China and that that could be a competitive threat um, as well, you know, partnering that with the previous humiliation that occurred and also how uh, colonizing the UK slash West has been, um, they could have felt as if they risked being colonized. Um, if they didn't fight for their one united Asia, which was the plan to rid the influence of the USA from the West and unite Asia into one empire um, and obtain world peace that way. Um, could have worked out for them maybe if they never bombed Pearl Harbor, if they just left USA alone. Maybe it could have worked out in the same way for, uh, for uh, uh, Hitler if he never... Uh, in attacked UK, maybe he could have just seized all of Europe. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, but then you have the other issue where Germany was also quite in debt to uh, USA and USA probably wanted the money back. Uh, <laughs> or USA kind of like lent everybody money. Uh, so, and also guns. <laughs> so they, uh, USA probably wanted a repayment. <laughs> so they probably would have intervened some way kind of like what happened in world war one where there was like an assassination and then some people defended the situation and then suddenly the good guys kind of become the bad guys and then everyone's suddenly the bad guys or everyone's the good guys depending on whose side you're on um so you have like a, a bit of an issue there right so what happens then is uh yeah you you have this situation right where a culture uh, becomes popular uh, and then it has to either engage in trade or it regulates itself. So it would be, even right now, uh, the UN is kind of the first time since the UN occurred, we solve the uh, overpopulation issue uh, because that was another same argument that the Nazis used uh, and Japan and all that used, which is we're overpopulating, we need land. Otherwise, we will starve and we take our interests more seriously than the interests of aliens um, or those who are abusing our economy and then cooperatively enslaving us. Um, so 
you have this issue where the wars happen and then UN set up and then finally for the first time ever we have a collective body of nations trying to manage issues such as government instability and overpopulation and migration and refugee status things like that right so uh, you know there's quotas on like how many refugees and immigrants certain countries can take in that is regulated by the UN um, things like that to try and help relieve some of these pressures that countries enter into war for to protect their own people so uh, that that innovation of the UN is very new right so you still have three thousand years three and a half thousand years prior to that innovation right of a global trade network um, and global governance uh, to an extent, right? So that's one of the benefits of the UN. As evil as you know, some allegations of the UN are, and I'm not denying the truth or whatnot, right? There's some dodgy uh, things there, like the uh, movie uh, Whistleblower is like one example of that. Um, one of the inspirational stories for Snowden as well. Uh, so you do have some horrible things for the UN, so also some corruption, but its main innovation was preventing world wars. And now the wars happen without lives being lost to an extent. Now it's like propaganda wars, um, big instability, national instability, things like that, um, which is probably better than everyone just rocking up and shooting each other. So, uh, yeah, so you still have three and a half thousand years where people have to regulate that problem without the innovation of global government. So, the way you regulate that uh, is an environment of colonization, a environment of trade, an environment of assimilation, an environment of networking, right? Like the Silk Road and those innovations, which didn't just bring material goods like spices, but they brought psychotechnologies. They opened up the ability for the world and the human species to like not just trade physical goods, which was important, but trade ideas like how to build things trade engineering trade political ideas and it just exploded the power of humanity right trade network so however trade works as long as those you are trading with or have your interests in mind and uh if anyone has ever played the game risk uh things like honor and integrity are uh, very rare qualities in the human species. <laughs> uh, maybe like one out of 10 games you play, honor will be uh, respected. So you'll form an alliance. And even if you are, uh, you know, let's say you now become useless, uh, they will probably kill you, the people you had an alliance with, so they can try and win. Whereas an honorable society, they'll keep you around, uh, you know, to die with you, uh, that loyalty, um, even if, it seems neither of you could win. The loyalty comes first. So is loyalty something worth dying for, right? So one of the only ways to guarantee that uh, you won't be invaded is to have a defense that they will be intimidated by. This is why there is like 7,000 nuclear weapons on the planet because uh, it turns out mutual guaranteed destruction is a good deterrent for nuclear war, right? Because if Japan had nukes as well, uh, uh, America may be a bit more intimidated of bombing uh, civilians. Uh, so uh, whoever had the nukes first uh, ruled the world. Um, and luckily, uh, Russia had um, was also, you know, they were doing their own experimentation at the time. So kind of interesting that uh, maybe if Japan was more on Russia's side there, that was the other thing Hitler did wrong. He shouldn't have challenged Russia. He should have just left Russia alone. <laughs> and if Hitler and Japan and uh, Italy left Russia alone, uh, could be a very different world. Um, <laughs> not to, this is the defense of uh, uh, Nazis. Just saying that you know they could have. Um, I don't. I don't. I'm just saying strategically, like you know. Manning uh, the position, uh, maybe it would have worked out better for them. Right, so you have three and a half thousand years where you don't have a united governance, you don't have you 
you know, a global police, like a world police, like which America tried to be. And that great movie came out by the South Park people. So you have to have innovations here. And those innovations were, why is our culture important? Let's have a great spirit. So, so our culture survives these ruthless invasions. And also let's have a, let's make ourselves and our nation through the embodiment of collective will, strong, principled, and able to revise itself uh, and trade with others. Um, and the warning there, right, is like, like the, the book, Odyssey, it starts off with Odysseus pillaging a thing and then being cursed because he pillaged it. And then at the end saying, we have to pillage again, right? So <laughs> it's very much like, like, hey, probably a little warning here of something you guys haven't sorted out yet, right? Like, like you know, like in a, a gesture of irony. Um, so in the modern context, one of the things we can learn here is like against the Cold War for propaganda and misinformation and dissent and increasing issues. I watched a talk, I'll link it below, I only watched it today, where this uh, fantastic scientist, researcher, uh, who was entrusted with a lot of data that normal people aren't entrusted with, uh, was able to analyze the effects of fake news and he found that fake news spreads quicker uh, because it is more novel, but specifically novel in emotions that are extreme, uh, which is disgust and surprise. Uh, whereas real news generally just has things of, oh, okay, I knew that. Oh, I suspected that. Yeah, okay. Right, like not a big deal. Um, whereas fake news uh, spreads so quickly because it's like, oh my God, this just happened. Uh, or, oh my gosh, those bastards, they're evil. So Probably when you're consuming things in mass media, if you're feeling surprised or disgust, uh, you, you should probably uh, reevaluate what you're doing on mass media and maybe quit it and go outside and talk to people rather than spending your time consuming the internet. Luckily, you're here watching this video. Uh, so, you know, yeah, but uh, join the Discord server and actually participate. Um, in these calls as well. I, I greatly appreciate that because uh, the point of Bevery, this channel, uh, is twofold. One is to go through, you know, philosophy, build up an ethos that actually gives you good reasons of why you get up in the morning. Um, you know, like the main philosophical question is why, uh, why bother living? Um, and then the other part is, uh, a mutual empowerment which is if i'm just preaching to you uh you have to to somewhat delegate your agency to your belief in me uh whereas if i can converse with you i can also learn from you and uh revise myself even more so and you also get in the practice of revising yourself as well and that's uh one hell of a thing and that's also the uh this guest friendship right like we should be able to engage with each other with hospitality um i should be able to help you out and you should be able to help me out and we should be able to engage with uh trade with each with each other a safe journey to our home um and otherwise we incur the curse of zeus so the political instability right now in Myanmar or in America um, or in Hong Kong uh, can be considered the uh, curse of Zeus, uh, which is that people did not heed Xenia uh, within their own factions. And Zeus is now bringing down a terrible storm upon them. Uh, they're spending their time Specifically in America, they're spending their time uh, radicalizing rather than um, extending uh, their hand to each other, slapping each other rather than uh, comforting uh, each other, uh, and that's a uh, a bad place to uh, to be, uh, especially because. If you don't go through that mutual respect at the beginning, like that's one of the key things about that aura, right? Which is it starts off 
where first you make sure the needs are met. You clothe them, you feed them, you bathe them, right? You extend, you meet their physiological needs. You remove their anxiety, right? You comfort them. You embody them in the womb of your home, right? You do the whole, ah, uh, what was that saint? Uh, I think, you know, the one who called everyone her children, um, right? Like, you know, if everyone is part of your family, you will treat them as your children. Um, and that's part of like the Jesus love idea. Um, and Jesus, you know, he came 1,200 years after uh, Homer's works were formulated. This idea of our love should not extend to our people, but extend to everyone. Um, that love that Odysseus had for his kingdom should extend to everyone. And uh, your love should also extend to those who persecute you. Uh, these are really uh, powerful ideas um, because otherwise you invoke vengeance, you invoke hatred, uh, you invoke uh, yeah, the uh, lightning bolt of Zeus in the final scene of Odyssey, where uh, the villagers are um, fighting for the honor of their deceased sons, uh, the suitors against Odysseus who fought for his uh, home, his household and his family. And uh, more of them died until uh, Zeus and Athena intervened. Um, and Zeus sent a thunderbolt down uh, to warn everyone it will get a lot worse if you continue. Uh, so it's, it's, I don't know. I watched, uh, uh, Crossfire last night, Lauren Southern's documentary. Um, she kind of gives like a fairly balanced for like a f four out of 10 balance, which is a lot better than like just radical news of like no balance at all. So it's a, l a little bit good and balance where it's like, oh, it's kind of fairly well argued for like presenting both sides, but like very sensationalist, still very like, yeah, the alt media isn't mass media. No, you can trust us. We're not biased at all. <laughs> we're not adding into the attention and economy and we're not uh, campaigning to your, uh, your, your dissolution at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, ah, oh, those, yeah. So besides that issue, uh, you know, it's good as a catalog of the footage of both sides. Um, then with some sensationalist biased uh, 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 overtones to it. <laughs> um, but the footage is the important bit because like if you go to places like Live Leak or like Bescore, I think Bescore recently got brought out, but like uncensored versions of YouTube, uh, you will see footage from both any political spectrum on any side of the world that is absolutely horrifying. Um, when the riots were happening in America, you would see uh, protesters absolutely destroy or rioters absolutely destroy innocent people, their buildings, police, just destroy them. And then you would also see footage of police and military destroying uh, protesters uh you would see viciousness on uh on both sides and the only appropriate response i think to that is uh is uh compassion for for fighting children um and uh because otherwise uh you know, yeah, Zeus will send his lightning bolt down. Um, and if people don't heed that omen, uh, it, it gets worse. And Iliad was kind of one of those stories where it's like, hey, maybe pillaging uh, other nations can bring out wars. And there's actually a great scene in Iliad where, uh, uh, you know, uh, Agamemnon gets uh, tricked 
uh, to enter into the war, right? Uh, because they're not really ready to fight. They're going to like get great uh, losses on their side. It's not going to be an easy victory. So they enter into war very haphazardly. But he decides, okay, I should test the gods because I know these gods are sneaky, right? And it's the same thing with us, like in our conscience, even in the modern age, right? Like we have a conscience and sometimes the little voice is completely correct and other times it's a bastard and a liar and it's Satan whispering to us, right? Um, I guess not good advice. So what you want to do is you want to test your conscience uh, and make sure that you're actually hearing words of wisdom. Um, so Agamemnon does this where he's like, okay, I'm going to test the gods and I'm going to rally up all the troops who are on the shores ready with the ships and I'm going to tell them, look, we fought this war for so long, it's time to go home. Let's go home. And everyone is like, yes, we finally get to go home. Like, you know, as happy as Odysseus, you know, just wanting to get home, right? Like they home means something to them. It's something worth fighting for. And when they hear that they can go home, they're very happy to go home. And it was the intervention of um, one of the generals, I can't remember exactly who it was, who then was able to say like, no, no, this is a test. We're actually fighting. And then some of the people like, oh, why are we fighting so the kings can have their bitches? Like, like, what do we get out of it as the people? And then he gets reprimanded by, you get your nation as a person. Um, but, you know, so <laughs> it's kind of uh, funny in that extent, like that little scene. So, yeah, we have this uh, situation where we really need to... Um, uh, yeah, find out in our own culture uh, what's worth fighting for. And like the left and the right, they have different opinions on this, right? Like the defining char characteristics of them, because like this is exemplified by the wage gap where you have like a men's right activist and like, well, the wage gap is just myth. The women get paid the same as the men for the equal work. And then you have the feminists who are saying, yeah, but the problem is we don't do equal work because we have different preferences and that's unfair we need to be treated equally because we're human too we're equally valuable as humans um and that's the argument you have the the right wing is saying people are unequal and that's okay and we should treat them unequally and that's okay and the which is meritocracy and then you have uh the left wing which is saying no everyone is equal and and they are not and we should extend our sympathy and compassion to them to provide equal outcomes. Um, so, and this is where like the nuance of like equal opportunity falls off like the whole thing. Like Peterson hasn't thought this through where Peterson's always like, oh, I'm for equal opportunity, but not uh, equal outcomes. Well, it's like, how do you measure that people are getting equal opportunity? You measure it by the outcomes, right? If they have the same outcomes, then they had the same opportunities. The problem is, <laughs> is uh, like equal outcomes is a yardstick for uh, equal opportunity. And until people realize that and that the debate isn't about those two things, the debate is what's fair, um, which is, for instance, like compassion and welfare. Like welfare is saying you didn't get the same opportunities, but here's some, e some equality in materialism um, to help you. Or in the case of charity, uh, like churches and community, uh, you didn't get equal opportunity, but here's a family that will support you. We're here for you, right? Uh, so that's that's part of the argument there, where they're going about it in different ways. You could have like a libertarian way of charity and community, or you have an authoritarian way of wealth redistribution, enforced wealth redistribution by gunpoint. Um, so, you know, that's kind of like a battle of how those things play out. Um, so right now, there's some really uh, typical arguments in the history of civilization, like what happens when a country uh, feminizes, you have the idea of treating people as children and kind of eliminating self-responsibility and accountability, which is kind of instilled by father figures um, historically to provide maturity. So a child ceases to become a source of the light for the mother into an actual 
person capable of having their own family um, and grandchildren, right? Like a a mother uh, should bring more delight from grandchildren necessary than her own children because it means she's successfully passed on a family. Um, so, because uh, otherwise you have the Oedipal mother and that's actually alluded to in, in Odyssey um, where the mother marries her own child and he kills uh, his father. Um, and that's another example where the that's something not worth fighting for. <laughs> Sorry. So, you know, or Agamemnon, where his wife was loyal and kill, unloyal and killed him, not worth fighting for, not worth returning home for. Right, but Odysseus's loyal wife Penelope, something worth coming home to, right? So you know, this is like one of the battles that's happening in the West, which is um, we have two different sides that are speaking completely different languages, which is like the left versus right, or masculine versus feminine political biases, um, and they are. They need to talk again, be married to each other again, um, like, you know, metaphorically married to each other. Physically would also help, right? Uh, because it removes uh, intragender competition. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why marriage was such a good tool for civilization, because if you, like marriage and civilization kind of went hand in hand, because if you, polyamorous societies generally aren't civilizations, uh, I should say societies without um, because the Greeks did have many wives. I would just probably say like, yeah, where women have multiple men doesn't go well for civilization because it raises questions of fatherhood, it raises questions of legacy, it raises questions of why the men should even bother fighting, right? Or why they should even bother working or competing with other men. So you have a lot of intragender competition where the men are just competing with each other to get access to that very scarce resource of reproduction. Um, and the women are competing with each other to get access to the best men. Um, so you have all this wasted productivity. And then you end up with this great institution of marriage, which is like, hey, everyone gets a partner, you all get to reproduce, you all get to have a family, you all get to pass on your legacy. You don't have to compete with each other anymore. Instead, you can work together, you can actually cooperate, you can build nations, you can build companies, you can build empires, because you're now able to cooperate with your fellow man. Isn't that great, right? Rather than just competing with him so you win the reproduction game right or competing with her so you win the reproduction game like a whole bunch of anxiety dissipates from the nation if marriage is, is done um and this is one of the dangers uh that um you know traditions that don't know why they exist uh perish to uh things that are really bad but one of the great uh, benefits unlike Homer where these were verbal stories for 400 years and then written down with the internet this will live on hopefully forever <laughs> uh, so you know someone a thousand years from now can take this wisdom of our civilization and actually remember the actual learnings for why these traditions exist in the first place right like the 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 wisdom for the tradition when it's in, initiated can last thousands of years rather than just a tradition existing and no one understands why it exists in the first place. Um, so, you know, we can actually not throw the baby out with the bathwater because we can listen for why that tradition existed and not be so crude and crass to think that we are superior than thousands of years of fitness games, um, <laughs> which is one of the issues of the world wars, which is a lot of, uh, society is assuming that they can play the role of gods and they can completely eliminate God because of their technical brilliance. Uh, very bad idea um, because uh, you're, the, the, it's also the reason why the institution of science came because it allowed us to go from assumptions about what is true to then negotiations to what is true to then experiments of what is true 
uh, and then to not just anecdotal experiments, but experiments in the objective world that are counterintuitive to anything any human could have anticipated. And that's when we really separate uh, a narrative style operation of the world from an objective world. And that allows uh, humans to really reach into the, the stars. But we have to maintain both. We have to maintain like reasons why we ought to continue living as well as uh, reasons to provide and meet the needs. But it's also one of the other issues because if we solve and we get an endless supply of food, we get all our material needs covered, then why live? Um, and this is something we're going to cover in a follow-up episode of Beverly. Uh, we're exploring the question, is the internet a cult? And slash, is the internet a mistake? Uh, because in the same way where uh, the mezzanites uh, consider electricity a mistake uh, for what it has done to the operations of communities where people were happier prior to electricity. Uh, they are, they consider electricity a mistake. Now, obviously there's some revision that kind of more resemble the Amish now because some have onboarded electricity because, hey, tractors kind of really help with producing um, food and also trade with other communities in different geographical areas, provide you some resiliency against localized natural disasters. So, some things for managing scarcity turn out pretty good because they remove you from local locality of disasters um although the issues of poseidon uh so zeus uh wins uh because over poseidon right like zeus is the king of the olympian gods uh because it turns out trade is better than uh local disasters uh trade overpowers them um so yeah, uh, and also, you know, trade unites people, right? Like, like within the Greek culture, then, like the different nations, the different palaces, the different islands, they uh, they had the little different subcultures, and yet they were still able to engage in trade um, with each other. Uh, and you know, that was also seen once the Romans took over, and you know, Alexander the Great, uh, and all the rest of the stuff. When you had these huge empires of many different cultures. Uh, for a long time, they were able to bring great works like uh, 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 building uh, huge ecosystems of trade routes um, through a consolidated protection against foreign invaders, uh, even though localities still maintain their own culture. So, you know, one of the ethics that I kind of maintain or I think is a big solution here is like uh, a borderless economy, so global trade gives you resiliency against local disasters, very important. National cultures, very important to maintain an identity that's worth keeping and saving, right? And when you go to another country, be a good guest, right? So global citizenship, but national culture, you need to respect that national culture, but you should be able to be welcome anywhere. You should always be able to find a home. If your home rejects you, if your home uh, makes you feel unwanted, if you don't feel you're needed there and somewhere else actually offers you a better deal, go there, right? Or if your home is the best, you should be able to maintain it, right? Um, but as well, you have the UN kind of situation where it's like, well, what happens if somewhere overpopulates? Well, you then enter into a negotiation. You don't just get to decolonize, right? And that's one of the threats that the world is facing with China right now, especially like the India-China border or previously China and Tibet, where Tibet was a country and then China just rocked up and took it. So people kind of forget that Tibet was its own country and China just seized it, uh, as they're trying to do with the South China Sea and India, uh, the Indian border. Uh, so, you know, these threats are very, very uh, real even to today. Um, yeah, so again, uh, to rehash, uh, the Nossos, the journey home, why, why is it worth getting up in the morning? What is home to us? Um, and also uh, uh, a Xenia, which is extending your hand and comfort and uh, trade to others uh, of you know, aliens and foreigners. 
right? So you don't uh, be cursed by Zeus, very important. Uh, so with that, uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube afterwards. I've got a leg recording, it's been live on Twitch. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Leave a comment below if you have anything to add um, as well to it. Really excited about this. I think this should have been a good one. And we have our follow-up uh, discussion on uh, is the internet a cult slash uh, mistake uh, coming up in the next few days. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. You can get all the details at uh, berry.me. Thank you. Bye.